Well, it's that time of the afternoon again. Time to join us for uh, some exceeding, uh, exciting discussions with uh, David Beckwith from Riedel. We're uh, today diving into uh, Artist and Bolero. Um, we've talked about a couple of other uh, Riedel uh, products in this past week, week and a half. Uh, we started with MeteorNet, and uh, that one was uh, a pretty uh, insightful time uh, learning about products that maybe that we never thought about um, coming from uh, the communications background, uh, but embracing video and audio transport is uh, something that uh, uh, is going to be uh, more and more prevalent. Uh, but today, you know, uh, we're going to move to artist and Bolero. Um, obviously, uh, I would say everybody's heard of uh, the Riedel Artist frame by now. It's uh, become uh, um, definitely one of the uh, the main uh, main players in matrixed intercom and and when we think about it really intercom is just audio right it's just audio routing and um, we're uh, fortunate to uh, be able to to live in a world of, uh, of digital now that's uh, noise I'm, I've spoiled coming from a two-wire background and that hiss and all the buzz and the noise that we're used to just tuning out in our ears um when you move over to having a matrix or a digital system you're like oh i could live with this don't have all this noise but uh, i've got a lot of power uh behind me we're uh having a few more folks uh joining us but um before we get going today um pete and mac uh here we are again um obviously uh, both of you spend uh quite a bit of time uh behind uh this platform and logging a lot of hours um do you have any um thoughts before we uh get started today on uh um whether it's this topic or you know comms in general pete mac go ahead <laughs> yeah it's always mac always mac uh actually i'm excited to see this presentation because i do spend a lot of time um working with both both artists and bolero um i have a couple of clients that are 40 Bolero pack uh, clients that I'm very happy about. Um, and uh, you can always learn more. I mean, I'm largely self-taught or taught by Pete since uh, we've been friends for 40, almost 45 years. Uh, it's an exciting, f fun new thing even doing it. I mean, it's, it's part of the reason why I've stopped being an A1 and now I just do comms and RF. <laughs> It's uh, mm -hmm. uh, holds my interest more at this at this point, and so yep. I'm I'm excited I'm excited for today's session. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, you you mentioned Kelly about uh, glad not to do two wire and glad to be in the digital world. I have learned recently, past three years, that stage managers are missing that noise in the intercom system. <laughs> Yeah. So in the Riedel, often, usually, I put all the channels in Vox mode, and I get complaints from the stage managers on the free speak belt pack that their belt packs are dropping out. And finally, when I go listen to them, it's when they're quiet, the hiss in the background goes away. So I put them always now, the stage manager and production channel, in always, just mm -hmm. because it drives them crazy. But I figure I could also use some kind of a... a audio playback device to put the clear calm hum and buzz back in the entire system and to be Always fair buzz. we'll throw rts in there too with the there noise makers that there are available um, definitely um so if you have any questions please feel free to enter them in the question tab in your uh webinar control panel and we'll pass them on to david and jeff so david yeah, and by the way let's welcome jeff um real quick i think those of us uh who were on with MeteorNet will remember jeff and uh, his presentation. So um, David uh, got a little little backup. We've got uh, David just had some great weather blow through, and uh, so uh, in true TV fashion, we're always ready with a backup plan, right? So Jeff's the backup plan, but also you know a lot of a uh, lot of cross uh, platform capabilities here. That's the power of a great brand and a great uh, the uh, the 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 office here in North America. I'd like to give kudos to the company for 
for providing the level of support they do. We really appreciate that. So um, we're going to get out of your way now and uh, uh, let you uh, share some uh, great insights for us. Sure thing. Thanks, guys. And uh, thanks, everybody, for, for joining. Um, I hope you're all safe and healthy wherever you are. And uh, Jeff, you're never a backup plan, buddy. You are always a primary plan. Um, so let's get started and take a look at some preliminary data here. Um, I want to start by taking a look at uh, Bolero. I think, as everybody knows, first of all, everybody can see my screen, Bolero V2 one product overview, I assume. You got it. Cool. Um, I'd like to start just by, you know, outlining what we're what we're doing here today. Um, I think the primary purpose is is really to, um, as the title stated, uh, scale Bolero to learn how to uh, implement Bolero in a practical environment. Um, what are the building blocks of Bolero? How does it work? How does it go together? Um, its integration to artists is is fairly fundamental in process, and we can go over that and take a look at the step-by-step -step approach. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through, uh, you know, a lot of the documentation in, in the form of PowerPoints. We're going to look at a little bit here and there, but we're going to jump back and forth to software because I think that obviously for you folks, that's the most useful thing. Um, so just to start off with a quick overview, um, I think you're all familiar with Bolero and what it does and how it works. Um, you know, Bolero in the integrated form relies on an artist matrix to do the mixing for it. Um, the Bolero, of course, in standalone form can be self-sustainable with the mixing and routing happening within the antennas. What we're talking about today is the integrated mode uh, where we're using the artist matrix uh, for the discretionary mixing and routing of cross points and mixing of audio on behalf of Bolero. So Bolero in this case is being used uh, really as a proxy for passing audio uh, from a belt pack to a matrix. And really all we're doing with Bolero is we're replacing, we're, we're looking at, at Bolero belt pack as nothing more than an inter intercom panel. And we're replacing the cable that traditionally went between the panel and the matrix. We're replacing that with uh, an RF transceiver that serves two purposes. It serves as uh, an RF device in the deck domain to transmit and receive audio wirelessly to and from the belt, the belt pack. And then we're also using that antenna as a network edge device um, to ethernet frame and packetize audio from that belt pack and then send it to and from the matrix. Um, again, it's, it's a proxy relationship. Um, the matrix is doing the routing uh, the mixing and the antennas are serving as as proxies to the belt packs. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about today has to do with the performance of Bolero and why we are able to do what we do when we talk about scaling up Bolero, when we talk about making it um, a system that can do things that other other systems can't do or haven't done in the past. So. To look at a few things first, uh, let's look at the overall capabilities. In the integrated version, we are now, as of firmware version 2.1, able to uh, implement 250 belt packs uh, in a Bolero system with 100 antennas. Um, now, there's three pieces to that equation, and we'll talk about them uh, throughout this process, but really, 250 belt packs in a system comes down to a few different uh, a few different things. It comes down to can the software interface uh, record and and register 250 devices. The second thing is can the software interface process 250 devices um, in in the in the context of RF uh, management. Uh, and third and finally, can the antennas host up to 250 belt packs? And we'll talk about what those three things mean and how they're different. 
So the first thing really to talk about is, is the performance of the system, um, the codec choice and the uh, RF hardware that's implemented in the antennas and in the belt packs that makes this such a great system and, and a versatile system uh, and a system that we're able to scale up beyond what it was supposed to do originally, um, which is a great, great thing. So first off, the codec. Um, the codec is, is something new and different. It's not a G.711, G.722 codec that you're used to seeing in traditional uh, RF devices. Uh, it's not analog, it's digital. It implements something called um, digital pulse mode modulation. Um, and like anything, digital versus analog, um, it's, it's very apparent, very deliberate, um, and it's, it's got great definition. And that means a couple of things. That means that the codec uh, can be seen and understood in a high noise environment, and it means that the codec's image that it's transmitting can be seen and recognized and understood uh, by the opposite device, whether that's an antenna or a belt pack, depending on which way you're transmitting. And it can do that from a very far distance. It can pick out that signal from the noise floor, um, which is a great, great thing. And what that does is it enables our system to have a greater receiver sensitivity. What does that mean? It means that our belt packs can be further away from the antennas because the signal strength coming from the antenna doesn't need to be as great as it would in a normal uh, G.7 codec situation. Um, the codec itself, let me bounce to another document here. The codec itself is called a, a Broadcom BB32. And this is basically a, a high bit rate, uh, wide banded codec. So what you're gonna get is 32 kilobits per second. Um, you're gonna get 16 kilohertz sample rate, um, frequency response of about seven and a half kilohertz. So basically that's the lowest frequency discernible to the highest frequency discernible. Um, along with the fact that it's 32 kilobits per second bit rate, it gives you a high definition. Um, things are discernible. Louds and softs are more discernible than any other codec. Um, your actual spectral response, you know, the frequencies, the bass, the treble, all of those things. And what that all translates to in practical use in a loud environment is something that can be recognized and understood by the human ear better than any other device. Um, also, this, this signal can fit on a single time slot. And we'll explain what a time slot is later, but compared to uh, competition, um, it comes down to your digital footprint and how much space you need. Um, because this is a very efficient algorithm, we can fit everything we need to fit into a single time slot versus a lot of the competing systems which have to implement two time slots to fit all of their data into. Um, Jumping back, looking at RF multipath, okay? This is, this is a big, big thing for RF. This is probably the biggest single coefficient in any RF system. Um, RF typically is referred to sometimes as black magic. And it's very true. Um, you just never know what's going to happen when you bring uh, you know, a radio frequency emission into a space full of metal, uh, into a space with other competing systems. The great thing about this system is that because it has multiple antennas in its array, and those antennas are fashioned um, in different geometric planes, um, you know, one being vertical, uh, one being horizontal, uh, offset in what we call the z-axis, what that means is basically we're catching more signal coming from the device that's radiating towards us. So if we're a belt pack and we're transmitting towards an antenna, um, the antenna is going to see a lot more signal and it's going to see a lot more variation of signal. And the first thing that's gonna happen in any environment is your RF is gonna be bouncing around. When it bounces around, it comes to the receiving device um, at different times in a primary transmission with no reflection or no multipath, it comes straight to the device. So it comes 
how it was meant to come. It's going to be vertically polarized. It's going to get there first. Multipath is going to result from reflections and signals are going to get there after the fact. They're gonna get there later and they're going to be off pole. What we mean by off pole is they're going to reflect and refract off of, uh, off of objects in the immediate vicinity and they're going to come you know, let's say off axis. And what the filters in the Bolero system do is they're able to basically look at all of those secondary signals and recognize that they're secondary signals, recognize that they're multipath, recognize that they don't geometrically look like they're supposed to look like, and they throw them out. And that results in a lot cleaner transmission. It results in the belt pack being able to lock to the antenna uh, a lot more often in a lot more of a volatile situation. Um, so a lot of tools that are in this system that aren't in any other system. Um, and these are some of the results, uh, you know, again, what we talked about, high clarity, um, things that are discernible, um, you know, perceptive analysis, that type of thing. Um, and part of what makes us score the highest on being the most uh, perceptive, being the clearest, uh, also is something called packet loss concealment. What we do, unlike other systems, is we are able to uh, basically predict when there is a volatile environment where we may uh, lose bits or pieces of digital frames of audio. Uh, you're always going to have that in any RF environment. It's about how you mitigate that that really counts. And in our system, uh, unlike other systems, we're able to uh, go through a packet loss concealment process where we actually predict what the missing pieces might have been and insert uh, a reasonable facsimile of that in place of the missing packets. Other systems do what's called zero fill or ramp to zero, which results in nothing more than, than audio artifacts and missing information. So that's what we mean when we say perception. Um, we are able to perceive no matter what the environment. We can tell what the words are that the director is telling us. We can understand the, the direction that they're giving us if we're a cameraman out in the field. We can do it in a high noise environment and we understand what they're saying. Um, and again, multi-path tolerance. Um, you know, again, it's all about the RF filtering. Um, it's all about catching as much wind in your sails as you can and knowing what to keep and what to throw out. Registration, I won't spend too much time on this. Um, you know, in any system, you're gonna be able to uh, basically take a digital picture of a hardware device. And that hardware device is going to be stored inside of a system. Um, in this case, we're storing uh, belt pack devices as recognizable pieces of hardware um, that belong to an environment, that environment being the Bolero antenna system environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, networking, of course, this Bolero system is in, in the copper network form is based on AES67. That's basically the audio transport, the audio and data transport format that's occurring between the artist matrix and the antenna, um, the antenna, the front half of the antenna as the network edge device. So again, this is no different than the old fashioned you know, KP32 attached to uh, an atom matrix. This is no different than the uh, RCP1128 uh, artist panel connected to an artist matrix. It's the same thing. We're still transmitting audio and data, except we're doing it in a different format. And we're using the antenna as a proxy to the belt pack. So the network plays a very substantial role because AS67 is such a, a you know, not over complex, but it's a complex uh, layer two, layer three, ethernet framed packetized data format. Um, and part of what Bolero needs as a, as a system is a very precise uh, method of timing. And you may be familiar with the term PTP. Uh, PTP is nothing more than, um, it's really nothing more than a network form of Genlock. 
So in the old days when you would uh, reference a camera CCU uh, to a switcher input, you're really doing nothing different than that in this form. PTP is simply a, a layer two, layer three mechanism that sits on a network as opposed to sits on a copper cable in baseband form between a CCU and a switcher. It's no different. You're, you're referencing devices to one another. And the important thing here is that um, as Bolero relies on a very precise timing mechanism, it needs a very precise timing uh, product to reference to. So PTP is that reference. And as such, we need to really be careful about how we build our network. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Questions so far? None, none yet. Okay. Uh, I think what I'll do at this point, I want to show you guys the, the interface. Um, I want to show you how we kind of put these pieces together. Um, artists, hopefully you guys are all familiar with. Um, what we're looking at here is a basic building block of artist software. Um, this grid you're looking at represents the interior of an artist frame. It represents the, the hardware entities that make up a matrix. Um, in the context of Bolero, what we're talking about is AS67 matrix cards. Again, if we picture the scenario of an intercom panel, a matrix, and a wire connecting them, we're talking in this case about um, a matrix card, a piece of hardware that's going to host the antenna device as opposed to the old fashioned panel. And it's going to route and process the audio. Now in AS67 form, we basically have to reference these devices to one another. Uh, and what that means is basically, as these are IP devices, ethernet devices, every one of these matrix cards, instead of connecting a cable to a panel in baseband form and letting it do its thing, um, we have to configure these cards. Okay, so every card is going to have an IPv4 um, IP address, netmask gateway. Uh, this is all routable. It's no different than any other Ethernet product. Um, you're basically just telling the network, I'm a device. This is my address. We're using this address and this, this personality to uh, route and associate to it across the network. Okay. Um, every antenna has this same look. Uh, it, it allows you to program a basic IPv4 uh, assignment into it. Okay. Um, on the other side, we look at antennas. Antennas also are devices. They have names. They have basic IPv4 uh, address schemes. Again, they're just personalities given to the device and put on the network so they can relate to one another. Okay. Um, in a basic form, this is what we're doing. Okay. And this may be a little bit high level, but I want to explain this. I want to expose you to this before we go through the actual programming so you can understand what it all means. Okay. Um, a bell pack is transmitting to an antenna. Uh, this happens in the deck domain. Okay. There's timing associated to it. Um, the antenna receives those packets. It turns them from RF data into packetized Ethernet frame data. Um, the antenna has an IPv4 address on the network. Um, it's associated to a domain. The information is transmitted from the antenna to the switch. Um, the switch then forwards all of this traffic uh, to what's known as a multicast group. Okay. The Bolero system, as a group of antennas, as a common group of antennas, shares what's called the multicast address. And this is kind of a, a virtual entity on the network where audio is shared between belt packs and a matrix. And really any, any audio that's shared between these devices will, will reside there, will be routed there by the network, by the network switches and the management that is running inside of those switches. Okay, so every belt pack has an identity, has its own multicast address, and has a port number. 
and that gives its its identity. The antennas as a group are responsible for sharing and distributing all of this data. Okay, so just running through this very quickly, uh, your antenna has an identity on the network. It's routing audio from this belt pack through this address. Uh, the switch is forwarding it to the matrix. The matrix receives it. It does what any other matrix does in terms of routing audio to and from a device. And let's say a call from belt pack one has to go to belt pack 10. So in this case, uh, the matrix is understanding the instruction of saying, okay, I've received the audio. I sent it to the address that needed to be sent to. And now I have to send it back to the, the edge device that wants to receive this call. Again, no different than taking two panels and throwing them on a matrix and calling from one panel to another. We're just doing it through ethernet. We're just doing it through IP, okay? So again, the process in reverse, we're leaving the matrix, we're sending this audio from the matrix uh, to a specific belt pack. Uh, this belt pack has a port identification number. In this case, it's 1001, uh, it goes up to the network, it knows the source. The source is the matrix hardware that it came from. Uh, this is where it's going, this port number and this at destination IP address. It goes to the switch, the switch forwards it, and it broadcasts it across the entire domain. And that's why no matter what belt pack that you have, you're connected to at least one antenna. And if you're connected to at least one antenna, then that antenna is going to have the broadcasts for every belt pack in the system. And what it does, as it states here, is it, it's basically going to throw out all of the traffic except for the traffic meant for this belt pack on this port. Okay, so every antenna is gonna know at that moment what belt pack it's hosting and what belt pack it's not hosting. It's gonna throw away the traffic that it doesn't need and it's gonna keep the traffic it does need based on the addressing of the belt pack, okay? Now, I understand that was a little bit high level, but I wanted to explain it up front just to give you a little vision, a little bit of exposure. Not that I expect you to memorize this. It's really just meant to be uh, an overview, to be recognizable for you, okay? So when we start in the artist matrix, again, we're going to an AS67108 card because that's the format, that's the transport format is AS67, okay? And that's nothing more, again, as uh, an ethernet IP format where we talk about transport and application layer. We talk about how do we get this stuff from point A to point B over a network using either layer two or layer three, okay? Um, when we start, we're simply describing what device is residing on that port in that piece of hardware in the matrix because this piece of hardware again is responsible for hosting the identity of this device now in in normal life in the old-fashioned days whether we're talking about az edit and kp32 uh and we're going into program uh, you know where that resides in a matrix if we're going into a conventional uh baseband artist system and we're describing uh in this case uh where a panel connects and what the personality of that panel is, we're doing the exact same thing here. All we're doing is we're changing the device. We're changing the edge device, okay? And here it is, a picture of a belt pack. And in this virtual system, in this director software, what we're doing is we're describing how to build a personality, just like we would on a panel, except we're doing it on a belt pack. And think of this belt pack as nothing more than a, a four key or six key intercom panel that's not rack mounted that you simply wear on your hip, okay? And again, here is the personality of the belt pack, okay? It has a multicast address and it has a user ID and it talks on a port number. Just basic ethernet stuff, just basic IP stuff. Now, um, this is akin to voice over IP in the sense that this is almost like a SIP ID, this Bolero user ID. So what we're really doing is, is we're assigning each device 
an address and we're pointing it to another device with an address. In this case, we're pointing the belt pack to an antenna and we're saying, this is my multicast address. This is where I live. And this user ID means everything. It's almost like a SIP ID in VoIP where you're pointing devices at each other. In this case, it's an antenna and a belt pack and you're asking uh, a phone book almost to go through and match a user ID to match a node ID. And once it does, it connects the two together and the system is going to take everything that it has here, this personality and transmit it to, in this case, the antenna. So the antenna can send it to the belt pack and say, belt pack, this is your identity. These, these are your keys. This is how you function and this is how you operate. Okay. Once we go into the Bolero domain and we look at a belt pack, we see an ID number. Okay. Now, once you register a belt pack to a system, this ID number is used to reference back to your artist system and reference to this ID number. So what happens in the network is you take all of these identities and these identities, again, are multicast addresses, one for each bell pack and a Bolero user ID, one for each bell pack and your key population unique to each bell pack. And you're taking all that and you're sending it to a network. The network through something called IGMP is taking a look at all of the members of a group and making it available to the edge devices that are asking for it. Okay, so in this case, the antennas in the system, these devices are asking for the personalities of these belt packs, okay? And when it receives them, it knows who they are. Now, when you go to look at your belt packs, you're basically entering this number and that number references that phone book, that IGMP group information, and it references that number and it matches it back to artist based on what you put here. So it sounds complicated. It's really not. It's a simple IP addressing scheme is really all it is. Now in Bolero itself, let's take a step back and look at how this is created. What are we looking at here? Okay, this really is a software interface that we browse into. Um, and we're looking at all of the virtual entities that exist in the system, okay? Now, in any system, these devices are advertised on a network. Um, we can see them, we can manipulate them. When you begin, all of these devices will be introduced into this interface as individual entities. Now, once you grab them all, you can group them virtually into what we call an RF domain. And this is what we've done here, is we've grouped these all together virtually, and we've created an environment. This is a virtual environment. All we've done is group together antennas and artist AS67 matrix cards. Again, the antennas and the matrix cards, they are both network edge devices. And, and again, you know, think of this as, as the old fashioned connecting a panel to a matrix with a cable in between. It's just the modern day form of it. So we're using these devices, we're using this interface to virtually associate these elements to one another. Now, once we do, we're able to basically have the antennas turn on a registration mode where they go out and broadcast a pilot signal. And when you turn on your belt packs out in the field at the beginning of time, when, when these aren't registered and they have no identity, these belt packs turn on and you can go on to a registration mode where you basically ask the belt pack to scan the environment for an RF signal. Now, when it sees the pilot signal coming from the antennas, it will detect it and ask if you would like to connect to it. So of course you would. So you ask the belt pack to connect. This environment, this software interface we're looking at will basically take a digital picture of the belt pack and it will put it into a list, okay? 
and it's going to correlate basically a hardware ID as the entity, and it's going to ask you to assign a virtual ID to associate to that belt pack. Okay, so once you do, again, it's going to pick up the personality of this ID number that you've programmed in Artist. So again, sounds complicated, fairly simple when it really comes down to it. Any questions, questions so far? Come up. Sure. Um, uh, how many hops can you do between the first switch and the last for antennas? That's a really good question. And, and again, that goes back to the network environment. If we think about, let's pull up a picture here. Um, if we think about switches and we think about PTP, again, the, the antenna and the bell pack um, are using a process called frequency and time division multiple access. Now, what, what the heck is that? Basically, what it does is all of the belt packs can share a common frequency or a common carrier and simply occupy that carrier at different moments in time. So it's almost like a shutter on a camera where you're taking very, very quick, short um, snapshots of information. So belt pack one uh, might be using frequency number two, and it's using it you know, every other period. Uh, belt pack number two is using that same carrier just on opposing periods that belt pack one is not using. So almost snapshots of audio. Now, you can imagine you're taking snapshots of 10 belt packs, which is what an antenna can carry, and you're sending all that information wirelessly to an antenna receiver. That's a lot of information. So what has to happen is there has to be a very precise timing mechanism that can be used to reference and mark all of those audio packages and put them back together in the right order when they get back to the antenna from the belt pack. So because it's such a precise process and because it requires such precise timing, it has to have a David, I think we've lost you. Did we lose David's audio? Yes, we did. We did. Darn, Dave. Um, you can finish question, your thought. Well, you know, the question really goes um, to the network, right? Do you have a robust network with PTP timing and boundary clock and something that is going to keep all the timing in place? Uh, that, that, that's a big question. That's a big do you have question right there. Uh, so I, I would look at that. Uh, there is no real finite answer to say this many hops. I can tell you that the default inside of um, I can tell you that the absolute default inside of the system is set to, uh, actually, I'm going to pull up the setting right here. Hold on real quick. I'll go in and edit network space, and then I am going to, I have a presenter. Can I share my screen, guys? And by, we're going to make you a presenter right now. So let's see here, and you are now a presenter coming to you. Here we go. Uh, let me see screen two. Go my screen. All right. If you're familiar with the. Uh, no, we, the, we like uh, that uh, background there, man. I like that. Yeah, dreaming of a day when I can go back on the trails. Yes. Um, so, okay. Uh, this is really what you're going to say is it's time to live. If you know anything about. Uh, uh, networking, you know, TTL, right? And, and that's how many hops, basically. And the default is 16. I, I played with it earlier today. I could 
I put in a hundred earlier today, but it, it really 100% truly depends on your network. Boundary clock, all those kind of things are things that you need to look at inside of your system and determine uh, can your network handle it? Because the system is built to handle it. The question is more of a network. How can the network handle it? There was an early time when we said three hops on an unmanaged switch um, and a switch that didn't have PTP boundary clock and those kind of things inside of it, something that wasn't a PTP aware switch. So we really have to start asking ourselves those questions. It's more of a networking question, really. Uh, another uh, question, next one was, why is the total amount of users per antenna 10? That, my friends, is simple. Um, when you are dealing with DECT, right, there are 24 individual time slots inside of one DEC band, right? One one center carrier, you know, frequency. There's 24. Well, what wait a minute, why 24? Hold on. We've got... 12 for transmit and 12 for receive. Those are time slots. And I think Dave talked about the time slots early on in the presentation. Two of those are set in there for play nice and handover. Overhead, okay. Yep. And so that's how, you know, the other systems can talk and register and and, and one system, you know, one belt pack can wander onto another antenna. The antenna can right. tell you that it's full and those kind of things. So right. they're reserved. So that's how we get to the number, right? Okay. There are okay. that that answers it. That answers it. I don't want to go into too much detail here. Oh uh, come we, on. We only have six hours for this show. Um are there any plans to include support for another codec like Opus supporting higher frequencies over 7.5K? Even if two or more frequency slots are required, which would make your your antenna only do five bell packs. I do not know of any plans. That's more of a product management question, but I can say this: this is all about comms, and this is a very very clean um, solution when you're talking about comms, right? Got it. Yeah. Spoken word. So no plans right now. Um, None that I know of. Hennig does say Artist and Bolero only available in Windows, but in reality, a lot of the Bolero programming is done in a browser, so it works on any computer. Well, I, you know, uh, I might point out that if you can see my little Apple icon up here in the upper left, yeah. oh, no, I'm that's running true. Parallels, um, correct? Or actually, I'm running fusion I've, I've run both over the years so but what uh, is, but see you're running and, you're running bolero in safari which obviously isn't windows exactly there we go right so i have actually been on shows where i put my antenna programming this screen on an ipad it is over, the, over the wireless network and it worked fine works perfectly um, fine it was designed and, exactly uh, for that apparently uh David had said that network cards use DHCP, and question is, when would network cards use DHCP? When you want to use a DHCP server, um, let's you know that's that's more of networking, guys. Uh, yeah. Sometimes somebody wants a static uh, IP address, and they want to have control of their ARP tables and those kind of things, and set those things up in their switches, and that's that goes to really advanced networking stuff where you really set up right. your DHCP server. The uh, multicast uh, addresses, as you add ports, I know, increment automatically and enter the number, but uh, that's not necessarily an automatic assignment. So the Bolero user ID is from the top to the bottom of the tree an incremental assignment, but the multicast address, and I kind of cheated and read ahead in the questions, uh, is assigned by the user. Why? Well, I mean, that's basic IT 101. You need security. You need to be setting up your own addresses and figuring out what those are and setting right, those right. schemes up long before well, you it do doesn't this. necessarily have to follow the Bolero user ID, which I do just to keep my brain straight. Well, thank you for doing that. I have unfortunately seen situations where people don't do that and they skip around and well, that's on them. Exactly. 
Uh, now, they used to, uh, on a slightly prior, earlier version of Bolero, have to set the multicast IP address in the on the card as well, and it had to match, but that is gone away with a recent version, I think. The multicast IP address on the card, there is no... As long as I've been dealing with Bolero, there is no multicast IP address for a card specifically. On there the, is I'm, an I'm IP sorry, address. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. On the on the on the Bolero network. Uh, oh yeah, that's, that's in the Bolero network. You used to have to make sure it matched. Yeah, that would have been really in the network. Really really, right. Right. You know, when you were dealing with that, that doesn't really. There is a way to set it now, but. Uh, but it doesn't That's necessarily have to match to worry about. the same range the others are, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you do you ever configure PTP on switches or bother to or? Yes, I wouldn't even say bother to. I uh, when you purchase what's your a... what's your priority of PT, PT, PTP between the belt pack, the network card. And the antenna how would you prioritize those three things so hold on the belt pack itself doesn't get a priority in ptp right the devices that actually live on the network the things that are talking you know right over a cat5 cable and things that are going to be talking ptp the belt pack does not right all right so uh first i must make that distinction and then <clears throat> second you know once you get in there I would definitely say that you really want to use your antenna as the clock, if possible, if at which all possible. Is, which is the lowest number? Uh, where, uh, so once inside an antenna, right, you have a pre right, PTP right. master priority. This is actually the second number you can actually see in uh, setting of the card, right, that it'll actually say, PTV priority two. Right. Uh, why does it say priority two? There's another well, it's number. A slightly higher number. There's no. There's a priority number one. Okay. Which is part of your best master clock algorithm that the manufacturer sets, and you as a user should not be able to change. You're going to go, oh my gosh, now that it exists, I know that it exists, right. I want to change it. No, 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 no. Manufacturers know how good their products are, right? And right. um you wouldn't want, let's say, a Meinberg master clock uh, to be overruled by an artist card uh, on the network as to who is going to be the master, right? So that's the first so is, number is, that the is, manufacturers is the antenna, have to worry about. What, is one of the antennas set as your master? Is that the way you do it? Hold on, we'll get there. There's actually a way to do this. And, and, and I okay. think it's important okay. that we talk about this juju, right? Um, so there's that other number that we're not seeing here, but just know it exists. And that's part of the election process. Know that there's this number that you can affect. Why can you affect a number? Because then you have a way to slight the ballot box and stuff the ballot box per se, right? Um, so you'll notice that our cards here default to 120. And you'll notice that my antennas default to 120. 24. So this is a weighting system. It's, you know, who's going to float to the top, right? Zero being that you, your head's above water and, you know, let's say 200 being you're at the bottom of the pond in the muck and the goo. So it's a weighting system about who's floating to the top. So that being said, I will typically change my cards because I prefer that my antennas win. I will change my cards to a higher number, but I can show you how to make that number irrelevant. You can make it irrelevant by going down here to PTP roll. When we made the cards 2110 compliant, we had to put in this little box in here to make it that we could say, this card is only a slave now. It can never be the master. So its role is slave. You can change this number up here if you want, but now this card is always going to slave and is never going to become the master. Never clock. looks at that number. Exactly. It's never going to win the election. Then we can go over here and give our antennas a number. At that point in time, if you only have antennas and cards, well, 
uh, your antennas are going to win. They're going right. to win. It's just it's, it's going to happen. Right? Do you make one of the antennas lower than the other or higher than the other? Is okay. one antenna uh, master? Hold on. That depends on a lot of things. That depends on how you want to run your system. And I'm not a, about to tell people really how to run their system, but I'm going to tell you some advantages and disadvantages of running systems in certain ways. What you have to know is, okay, if all of my antennas are set at exactly the same number, there will be an election process. It's a lot of math that I don't have to understand, and those antennas, based on the network, will decide who is the winner. Cool. If the winner of that election somehow is assassinated, somebody, producer, decides to unplug it for some reason because they think they can get to the internet off of that green cable plugged into the bottom of my antenna. All right, we have a new election, and all of a sudden, we have a new master. When our old master comes back to life, right? Somebody plugs the cable back in because they couldn't get to the internet. We don't have a new election. Why don't we have a new election? Because already got we a already president. have somebody that's president. No big yep. deal. Yep. Okay. But if you decide to, to stuff the ballot box, if this is Chicago and you're voting early and often, right? <laughs> then when that guy comes back online, guess what? We get a new election. We've now elected a dictator. And when he comes back into the country, he wins. So how many hits, Peter, have we taken during our show? One more than you want to, at least. Exactly. So think about it. I had one customer that likes to set two or three of their antennas to lower numbers based on their knowledge of their network. But they know that those three are are going to you know always circle being the the elected master, right? Um, I think that that could be a good way to run your system. It might be better than running everybody at the same priority. Like uh, if there your are, three antennas were right by your your frame there, not yeah. on a, barely on a network, right? You want the least amount of hops from your master to your uh, slaves, right? And the vast majority of them. So if you've got a spine and leaf situation, you want that attached to the spine or the core or something that is the core, if you can. And don't worry about it. If you don't change the numbers at all, uh, more than likely you'll find that that's where that, that person will wind up because they take in account the network traffic during right. that election process. Right. Okay. I think that covers it. Uh, I, I had always worked with naming one of my antennas, the one right by my frame at, with the highest number, but I see the the uh, advantage to not bothering with that. Like I said, it's up to you. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, um, well, uh, Andre Rivera asks, is there a way to download artists to use to get familiar with the interface? Yes, and you can use it offline. Uh, you is it available as a download? Yes. If people don't own a system. Yes. Okay. I'm going to tell you. But you have to ask permission, and then you're and you're pointed somewhere. I think. Well, I'm going to point you. I'm going to point everybody somewhere. Uh, okay. Uh, right now, 116 people listening to my voice at this point in time. Uh, if you go on to, and everybody's seeing my screen, I'm going to do this. I'm going to type it in a global answer to everybody. Riedel.net, okay? If we're not looking for wine glasses and my internet is working. It's amazing when you're web streaming that uh, it takes Although time. Riedel wine glasses are very nice. They, they are good. Um, they, they don't... Um, Gosh, it's not loading. Is there any more to that link there? Or are you there we go. Hold on. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Trust me. Stick with me. We're doing this on the fly. Right. This live webinaring, Jeff. It's awesome. There we go. Okay. So, load the Readle web page. If you see my mouse up here in the upper right, bouncing next to this little thing that looks like a person's silhouette, Got my it. Readle. Got it. I want you to click on that. Set up your my Readle account. Okay, 
look, we don't want just anybody um, getting our information. So if you if you are a professional out there in the world and you want access to this information, put in your professional email here, put in the password. This will allow you access to the majority of our softwares, anything that's out there on our MyReadle site. Got it. Okay. So this gives you access to all of the documentation. And I beg you, please, before it's 2 a.m. in the morning and you're scratching your head, get yourself a MyReadle account because it does actually take interaction from an individual to actually authorize the account. They're going to get like 116 emails after this webinar. But someone has to go through and approve everyone. So set it up early, set it up often. And uh, so that way you know that it's working and you know that you can go on there and download, I don't know, the manuals, that mythical place where we sure, hide all sure. of the information that tells you how to do everything you ever wanted to do. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, by the way, 725 pages for the artist manual, I think right now, but it's a searchable PDF. If you can use Google, you can easily find your answers inside of the document that contains your answers you're looking for. So. I think that's good enough. They can, uh, I'm going to send that answer to everybody. Once they get in there, they can do the proper download. Um, Correct. I won't go through that. Peter Mason asks, where does the PTP clock live in this system? On TV systems, they have a master reference clock for the whole system. So your network topography, um, you have to deal with this new world with AS67 and 2110 where everything can be a master or a slave. In 2110, we have that ability to tell everybody that they're a slave. But all of this to tell you that it's one of your devices. It's, I mean, there's no simpler way to tell you. It's either your AS67 card, it's the card on your audio console or the Bolero antenna. Um, isn't, is there a list on your website about recommended switches to use, brands you've tested and models you've tested? Here is, uh, we, we do, we hesitate to put out a whitelist and, and it's like this. Uh, we have no control over the software that those manufacturers put Got out. Got it. Right. Um, so you need to have a discussion with the manufacturer, the switch manufacturer, and bring us into the discussion. We definitely help try to, uh, as best we can, ask the right questions. But is it a PTP aware switch? Does it do boundary clock or right. does it do transparent clocking, right? Um, At the very least, it has to be a managed switch. The very least, it needs to be a managed switch. Right. But I really caution everybody that you, as we start getting into this 2110 stuff, need to look at something with boundary clock. Yeah. Uh, transparent clock is fine, but really be looking at things with boundary clock as we move forward, as we build out these larger systems that we're talking about here today. Yeah. Uh, Juan Carlos asked that if the PowerPoint will be shared. Uh, some version of the PowerPoint will be shared along with the video. Uh, it, there actually are about 20 different PowerPoints used in this presentation, so some of it will be in there. Um, the uh, Cristobal says about the hops, Acrobat had a limited number from the master, but yes, don't think did. about it, at, Acrobat anymore. It's gone. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, is there so any, this you, is largely live demos. They're not in a PowerPoint that can be. Well, sent. no, no, no. But there, are, there's a lot of PowerPoints that David said he would be able to give us and put together into yeah. one. Yeah, sure. So sure. We're, but, we're not going to have PowerPoints of this screen, for instance. Right. Um, yeah. Is there an advantage to using choosing one antenna at both PTP and Deckmaster, or is it better to distribute the antennas? masters across all the way you recommended 
there is some weighting that you can do here inside of an antenna to 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 weight it as a deck master, but you cannot say specifically that somebody is going to be a deck master. The only advantage to saying, hey, this individual or weighting an individual to being a higher priority in deck is just so that you know where that individual is. Right. Because if you right. lose this one, you will take a hit on the system. Right. right? Um in general, if my switch works for Dante, will it work for Riedel? Okay, that's not really a question of will it work for Riedel. It's a will it work with AES 67? Right. Um, we've seen it both ways. So it's a hard question to answer. Um, right. We have, I have, I personally have seen it both ways. I know some people are going to like that answer, but I've seen it both ways. Um, in a Bolero system, is it possible for the AS67 card to be the master of a system and antennas run in slave mode? Or why would you not want to do that? I always slave my card to the antenna. Just a recommendation based on what I know of the devices. I can tell you that uh, the antennas are better clocks than the cards. Right, right. Okay, um, well, that's pretty much all the questions here. Um, oh, I, Robert Miles asked, just to be clear, both the user ID and IPS need to be assigned manually, uh, not necessarily as you add the Bolero pack to each port, the ID will be incremented, but the IP you have to fill in. Mm -hmm. So they won't necessarily be in order if you add them out of order on your ports. In other words, uh, if it's port one, port eight, port seven, it'll be user one, two, three. They're down the tree, and it's not as you add them, it's down the tree. So like if I added this one as a Bolero belt pack here, then I said that this one was a Bolero belt pack, right? Right. Seven. Let's go. But it doesn't renumber the other ones you already have on there, does it? No. So six, because we skipped one from that. But it's down the tree, and it, yeah, it does not rename. So if yeah, I yeah. guess if you put it on the tail end, and then you had a port freed up at the top somehow, now will right. it will it give you nasty messages if you try to edit that number? No. Oh, okay. But you obviously don't want to end up with two bell packs with the same ID. It won't let you do that. Right. Um, and uh, one note: as you sync bell packs to the system, the ID for that bell pack will come in at zero, right? Yes. That you is have a safety to then go feature in and inside find of Bolero. It to a particular channel, right? Like right now, if I have this belt pack sitting next to me and I add it. So the second step to registering a belt pack is changing its ID. So now if you arbitrarily change an ID to one that hasn't been used yet, did that belt pack become that other pack without any further changes? When? Like let's say I had 10 packs set up in my system and I go in and that number three pack, which, or either one, any one of them, you... if I change it to a number, did it just switch its identity to the other? It will not let you duplicate ID numbers. No, but if you pick an unused but one. If you pick an unused one, well, obviously it's going to associate with that port, right? Right. Um, it doesn't matter whether you do them in order or not. Right. Um, Kenneth Goodwin asks, is there a step-by-step -step video online of how to set up your artist bolero system well i know the answer to that yes it's on my website yeah but i'm sure true. there's one on the on the Riedel website as well no there is not oh darn it 
There uh, is not one. For a while, on the for a while there used to be uh, in YouTube a series of Riedel videos, but I guess they stopped doing that. Uh, they did that once. There was one release of them, and they they actually do still exist. Yeah. Um, if you want to see Thomas Riedel in a uh, well, in a UPS definitely. outfit, it's in there. Um, so I think we have lost David permanently, right, Kelly? That's okay. <laughs> yep, I I think so. And Jeff's Jeff's here, and you know, where would you like sure. to take us, Jeff? If we're if we're trying to, you know, uh, you you know our audience, we're a pretty broad and uh, uh, diverse group um, on this. Uh, An interesting thing to show, which I find is a huge advantage in uh, Bolero on a Riedel system. One is the <laughs> fact that it's really just a panel and You'll has all the functions. Me right now. Uh oh, it's David Beckwith. He wants there to do the go. presentation on your you your iPhone. I'm gonna ignore uh, that's it. That's your call. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we're gonna ignore so, Dave. So the other feature which uh, I have hoped for in the Bolero Bell Packs is some implementation of scroll lists. Or um, and or shift pages. I would think those would be two fairly simple things to do. It's, it basically emulates a panel. Yeah, but you nor I are programmers, so neither of us will truly know, will we, um, how easy that could be. Um, I thought this was a democracy. We have to vote on it, and, and uh, Riedel will follow our wishes. I'm going to leave I, that that's one alone. I cast my vote, so there we go. I have to leave that one alone. Um, um, all right. Let's cover some things um, since okay. I've got the screen right now. And I do have some of Dave's presentations here. I was tuning into a majority of what he saw uh, and said earlier. And I saw that we really got into the weeds about how everything works. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. We did see how to add a belt pack, correct? Yeah. To yep. an artist frame. Cool. Uh, we went over the IP address scheme of everything. Multicast, uh, right. Yeah, he 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 did a good job of that one just before he went away, and um, so we got all of that. But I think I, I think that what we really need to start talking about is antennas, antenna placements, and those kind of yes, things. Definitely. Uh, do you think we should cover it all? Belt pack programming. I mean, it's it's pretty simplistic, easy if you programmed artists. But I know that some users are coming at this from different angles. Well, I think if you could just uh, drag a few channels onto a bell pack and you have an active bell pack there, you could show how it shows up on a bell pack. Let's go quick, simple, and easy. Um, but let's just, you know, touch a little bit. Uh, okay. So I've got an active bell pack sitting here with me. And here we go. Bell pack, keys on it, all those kind of good things. It's attached to an antenna and it's built into the net. We've already got that far along. You might have to tilt it do down it. a little bit to kill the reflection when we look at it. There we go. That's good. That's good. All right. So let's program some keys. You know, it's drag and drop inside of director. Something on the left, drag it over to the right, put it onto a key. It's smart enough to know that we want to reciprocate that call. So we'll add another point to point. Hey, that's point to point's done. We know how to do a point to point now. Great. It's easy. Okay, that's the simplistics of it. Uh, adding a conference, everybody always wants to add a conference. We can go to our conference tab. We can make a, a new conference just by add conference. Uh, and we, so we get a long name choice here. Uh, we, that's more information for the engineers setting up the artist system. Right here, the conference is for everybody uh, tuning into this you know, individual, that's what they get to see on their belt pack. So Kelly's conference here, we can just drag on the key five. That's easy enough. Once we do that, we just merge this into here, right? So we can send that to our frame. I can go over here. 
And just like panels, you have these two belt packs on the screen there. You can yep. grab from the word Bolero one right up on the top. Yeah, as you saw, that's that how I actually program that one. Right. Yep. That was how we did that. That was. Uh, or or. My favorite is really just. I mean, the biggest thing that I love is about artists is add function, right? Right. Um, and then just this myriad of list of just call uh call the port that's point to point call the conference that's that group call that's your your party line where the neighbors are listening in can call you the group that's key? point to multi points yes you can you can, so stack. You can dr drag from another key onto the same key and they show up as two no you can't do that because Bolero or artist doesn't do that. Uh, I remember a time. I swear to you, I remember what a, a time when you could stack just by dragging things on top of things. No, artists, no, no. But it doesn't do that. Of course you that. can. Of course you can. Yes, you can. Guaranteed. Oh, oh go really? To, okay. Watch this. Hold on. A party just, line wait, on the left. On the left. I'll drive. Take, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna drag this. See this? I've got it. Yeah. I'm no, you can't drag it from. The, no, you can't drag it from a bell pack. You have to drag it from the left hand screen. Yes. That's well. See, we're we're both talking the same language here, friend. Because yes, you can take from the left and go here, but can I go from here to here? No, no. because that's dragging the entire properties no. of the keys. I only can take from, an only empty from the key left to there, there to there, stack it and up to there. sixteen. And you don't even have to stack up to sixteen there. You can just go call the, you know, add function call Correct. the conference, and you can Correct. add it the same way. Yeah. And it's not just a conference, right? Because you can sit there. And Anything, add any right. of these exactly. functionalities called IFBs, listen right. to ports, hot mics, remote keys, all these things. But just like panels, you drag around on the right hand side and it just moves the key and erases what was there before. And you and drag all something properties from the left the hand side, you add to the key. Yep, and all properties of the key. So. Got it. So if it was latching momentary, those things. Good. So let's cover antennas and how close they can be and what's ideal. Well, how close they can be? Well, I mean, uh, I typically put them in my cases stacked on top of each other, but I recommend something fluffy in between so they don't get scratched. Exactly, but you have to yeah. keep them all plugged in there. So they all have to be powered in your case, right? Shh, don't tell anybody, but uh, more than once I have stacked a bunch of boleros on, uh, on top of one another on a table and it worked. It I was subtitles. told by somebody that it's better to put Bolero antennas in bunches rather than spread out far apart in your venue. Any truth to that? If you read the actual documentation, the recommendation is that you uh, scatter them like a I want to say like checkerboard, you know, throughout. Yeah, I, I've seen that in the documentation, but a very large vendor of Riedel Artist and Bolero has told me that they got from the factory that it was better to cluster antennas and it would reduce the, because the coverage pattern go, is so big, that it would reduce switching between antennas and that that was their recommended way of doing it. It, you know, I go by documentation. Um, I've run it in both ways. I mean, the, the beautiful part of the system is you can go out there and play with it and see what works. Um, and in my experience, that works too, right? Uh, I can cluster them together or I can choose to stagger them around the room if you really start thinking about how we stagger once we get into this other presentation here that i've got of david's you'll see you know and it'll give you a thought process right um i i tend to to not stagger just based on the fact that it's easier not to stagger right you've got one central switch and you've got a you know you've got five cat five cables that are what five feet long a piece so uh it it's it's not practical to sit there and stagger them out throughout the room properly in the vertical orientation it just doesn't theoretically work for setting up in practice but it'll be a little bit better so let's go through david's powerpoint here and really talk about and how 
One quick yes. question before we leave this. Um, just like there's no shift key, there are no virtual keys on a Bolero Bell Pack, correct? Ah, not true. There are virtual keys. Look, I've got virtual keys. I've got, got up it. to 10 got virtual it. keys. Okay. Yep. So um, one use that we're doing in F1 Racing, right, is we're using, and I've demoed this several times to a lot of different people, where I'll give a stage manager a Bolero belt pack, right? Okay. And I'll give them their, let's just, case, let's just say six hot keys, keys that they're always using. I'll also give them a panel. All right. And that panel might have 12 or 16 keys. But on the panel, I'll have remote keys to the Bolero virtual keys to activate his microphone over here and I'll put no microphone on that panel. Does that make sense? So they, it's like you're using the headset of the Bolero pack for their panel. It's not even like, you are. Yeah. yeah. You are using it. So now you have a wireless headset to go with your panel. And if you put no microphone there, and you put no headset there for them and you just tell them, hey, you don't have to swap headsets right. anymore. because Pete, I'm sure so you've had that awkward. 10, 10 more keys. Yeah. Well, you get 10 more keys ish on the Bolero that you don't see. You're remotely controlling them from the panel. Right, so right. You can remotely control up to the 16 keys of the panel or the, the bell pack, as it were. And that would be on you and how, how you dealt that out with them. But I can, I can say, as I'm sure you've had experience, right? That you, had that awkward conversation where you'll have a EP with a headset for his wireless belt pack and a headset for his panel and he'll be screaming at you that his panel isn't working when he's wearing his headset for his wireless belt oh, pack. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So this might alleviate that conversation. Definitely this is a yeah. nice Good scenario. Way. I like that. And Pete, I think this is something that belongs on your website at some point. I like that whole implementation. It's something I hadn't thought about, but it's definitely in my bag of tricks now. I like it. Um, all right. So, you know, the big question everybody says is, how do I go to 100 belt packs? How do I go to more than 100 belt packs? Um, and the answer apparently cannot be, well, if you go to Europe, you can use 100 belt packs in one small RF space because you can then stack 10 antennas together because they give you more uh, slots to work with, right? They have 10 uh, deck band, you know, deck frequencies inside of there, and we only have uh, a smaller number. Did we skip a slide here, Dave? Oh, because he's animated his slides. Sorry, I'm going to give somebody else's presentation here. So bear with me. Uh, as you can see on the on the left, you know, deck bands here in the U.S. You, that's the first five. Lucky enough in Europe, they get uh, an additional five bands going to ten, so uh, they can crunch in a hundred belt packs in a very small room, and that's good for them. But what do we do on this side of the pond? Well, without all of those things and eating up some channels here. Let's do some basic review. The, the bell packs, right, are going to chew up time slots. And just because this one antenna uh, has 10 bell packs doesn't mean it neatly dices them up in the first 12. It actually is allowed to use all 50 time slots here for bell packs and will. Okay. Most people don't understand that belt pack one doesn't have to be slot one or two or three or four and, and so on and so forth in the system. The antenna will use what parts of the decked space that it sees available and spread things around as it sees fit and will hop because it's frequency hopping. Yay. What a fun way to go. Um, that's good because, well, people can't easily find your signals. That's bad because you can't easily look at a, a spectrum analyzer and know where everything's sitting, right? Uh, things are turning on and off so fast, you're really not going to see them anyway. If you put so, uh, 
three or four antennas in one small space or right next to each other in a small room, is there any danger of overloading your RF? Stick with, stay tuned. We're, we're going to get there. Good. Um, so we got 10 time slot uh, assignments, right? We got uh, five antennas, so we can get to 50 belt packs, five antennas, easy, simple math. And we got our normal deck space to work with here in the US. He's got some fancy, fancy, you know, animations here. That's all I gotta say. So we can see that in this single RF island, we have all 50 time slots occupied, right? We can agree on that one. 50 time slots are assigned. North American space, we don't get anything else to play with. So the approach is to focus on the idea that every antenna participating in the decked RF system detects, uh, is aware of the RF energy surrounding itself, right? These antennas, you know, if they can hop around in one space and use all of the RF available to them, then they can work with other antennas. How do they do that? You know, they're sitting there listening, right? And they are managing their own RF space. I'm sorry for the guys that are out there coordinating RF, but these guys are going to do their own job and they do a pretty darn good job of it, right? But we have the near field RF area uh, can be defined as an imaginary zone of RF, a certain finite strength that surrounds every antenna, okay? So we got this like near field. Dave deals with these near field versus, okay, everybody's got their near field. Where's the far field? There's the far field, okay? So this is that, that energy outside of that space. And this is almost, this is one RF space is what he's kind of showing here. So this is one room, right? This is one, permeation of RF in one centralized location, uh, all spacing out. Within that RF radiation level detection by any given antenna, the radiation orientation from its surroundings, right? So it's going to see what else is around it. And it sees, oh, okay, I've got this antenna over there using those time slots, and I got this antenna over there using those time slots. So everybody knows what's going on because they're their own little frequency coordinators. Peterskin's like tied up inside of miniaturized, sitting inside of the antenna, right? Knowing what's going on in the RF space. And so they just stack on top of each other and use what they can. We add somebody else, they find what they can, they use what they can, add more people, they find what they can until we fill up this space. So as you can see again, um, you've got Christmas, you've got the Lakers, but everybody uses their time slots as they see fit and what they can find inside of there. All the time slots are occupied by all the connected belt packs. Now remember, it's only connected belt packs, right? The true representation of a whole system right? Looks more like this. You got all your belt packs wandering around in their given zones and everybody moving around. So let's look deeper, look deeper at our five antenna array. And this could be on top of one pole. I did see um, when they went on tour with Beyonce, I think they had a five foot pole and they uh, put burger clamps on the back of the antennas. By the way, you can do that. And then they just stacked them vertically uh, one antenna on top of the other on this pole. And that's how they deployed them when they were going around the world. But every antenna has its near field radius, right? And every antenna also has its far field radius, okay? So it's not just that gray dot, it's just that whole area, right? We're all overlapping over one another. And we can see who's permeating where, near field versus far field. A single five antenna array, and it's outlying RF area. So we're like NAG 30. I can actually tell you that if you are in Walk Test Pro, very handy feature inside of Bolero, if you hold the belt pack up to an antenna, you'll only get a NAG 24. That is the best I've ever seen is a NAG 24. Um, as you start going away from that antenna, right? So we're in that center, we're NAG 30. We've got good RF signal from all of our antennas. But as we walk away, let's say that our near field ends at 
neg 42, right? And then neg 52, we'll, we'll call that, you know, and we just start permeating out and seeing what our readings are as we get away from this RF area, okay? So let's introduce a second array, the same RF island. Um, so another system, just another decked system. Yes, these are Bolero antennas, but just another decked system out there can be the same thing. Let's say some guys are next door on a stage, right? We can be side by side because we're perfectly covering our area, they're perfectly covering their area, right? And there's a little bit of overlap in there in the center. So the dark gray areas are near field RF radiation and the light gray areas are far field radiation. And that yellow area is our overlap area. We know, hey Pete, you on? Uh, Got to get to his mic. Pete is on. That's okay. Kelly, you know, what, uh, you know, where, where do we start to drop off with the Bolero belt pack? Negative what? Where are we, where are we starting to see issues? Um, wow. I think around minus 76. I 76, you might see issues. Uh, yeah. You, anybody got into neg 82, even into the neg 90s, right? Wow. It's not really. Not really. Uh, I've gotten out there. It's it, it can get hairy and iffy out there. And we honestly say that oh. at neg 72 is where you start wanting to put another antenna down. But as you can right. see, okay, we we are starting to overlap the systems here and you can start seeing it in like neg 82 is where we would get into the near field radiation of the other antenna. If somebody is transmitting on your carrier frequency, right? That is noise. If nothing else, that is noise, okay? So knowing that a digital RF signal can handle about, well, we, we, we like to say neg, uh, your 25 dB of noise. The other carriers, the other system is just noise to them, right? So you can start doing the math when you look at here at the, you know, neg 42, neg 52, neg 62, that we're, we're noise to one another at that point in time there in the middle. So once again, we show how it truly looks, right? So we have all of our antennas and near field radiation and all these belt packs scattered all over in 50 time slots occupied here and occupied in that that far field radiation but that you know might be out there in the neg 72s right so we have a full complement of 50 belt packs at this time all 50 time slots are occupied remember the antenna array is not completely active until you connect belt packs to it Okay, so that is a fully active array with 50 time slots occupied because there's 50 belt packs pictured there. Now I'll show it again, the two antenna arrays, right? Belt packs scattered around, we have 50 over there and we have 50 here in the left-hand side as well. So they can coexist with one another knowing that they're not going to get close enough and that they're going to introduce enough interference to one another that they're going to get that 20 dB of noise from the other side, right? So all antenna arrays A are scaling and, and the near field surrounding, right? To see what time slots the other array antennas are looking. Sorry. So everybody's coordinating the use of their 50 time slots. They can scan the far field, but it's just noise to them because they're below that usable noise floor to them. 20 dB isolation, we're fine. We're far enough away that that far field radiation isn't impacting us. We can reuse the original time slots over there, right? Uh, it's kind of like saying, if I'm in Los Angeles and I'm talking on uh, an FM radio station. You can actually reuse that FM radio station over in Arizona, knowing that the two cities are far enough apart that they're not going to step on each other, right? Because it is a clean RF zone again, so that we are allowed to reuse those time slots. If array A and array B are within each other's Neal field radiation zone, 
and RF radi radiation in the near field is strong enough that it will affect the RF of the other antennas, right? It's at 20 dB noise floor, right? I, I really think 25 dB noise, right? Here's where we're gonna have problems. Are, we're, are we this close that we're gonna have these issues? We're gonna start stepping on each other when we get this close. There's no time slots to turn up for A if B is already using all of them. It's not enough isolation res respect to signal strength. It's just not there. Another variation of time slot allocation with the same theory, right? System B is using 30 time slots. So system A, we have 20 time slots available, right? It's a math problem that we have to start doing with ourselves. Frequency coordination can now be as simple as an Excel sheet. How many belt packs are you using today? How many belt packs are you using? Because it's the same thing, right? We're allocating time slots and we're making sure that we don't get that magic number when we're overlapped. And I caveat overlapped here because you're seeing we can properly space things out. That 50 time slots, is that in the US decked band? Yes, sir. Okay, and how many in Europe? 100. Yeah, I really wish we could go to 100 here, but that's all we've got carved out. People are too busy selling off frequency space for cell phones. Um, let's set up an actual example. Physical building, uh, configure antennas in your Bolero RF system islands for standard procedure, context the US to U.S. equipment, any RF, uh, single islands have more than 25 belt packs, no more than 50 belt packs total. Based on the geometry of your initial antenna array, identify the potential and the additional belt pack usage areas, adjust, you know, if needed, right? Using a belt pack in Walk Test Pro. So this is this is where you really need to start taking notes, right? And, you know, in Walk Test Pro, we can start looking at, that's that's with the belt pack right here that I have in my hand, um, let's see here. Let me stop screen sharing for a second because this is huge for everybody if you don't know this. Yay. Um, I, you can see my screen, right, guys? You can see the belt pack. Yes, right. we see that fine. Sweet. Okay, so I'm going to hold down the menu key. The menu key being this one up here that says menu on it. And then we're going to hold it down until we see just the word menu up here, right? And then we're going to scroll all the way to the bottom. And unfortunately, we can't read it. Oh, wait. Oh, the screen adjusted. It's going to say service. So we're going to select service. We're going to go into test. We're going to go into uh, there's there's a debate amongst most people. My favorite to use is Walk Test Pro. Um, Walk Test Pro gives you the antenna number. That's the number that you've given it. Right. The RPN number, that is a derivative of the serial number, and you cannot change that. But this is what we're talking about right here, guys, the signal. And I'm neg 32 away from my antenna right now. And I know that it's OK. When I say OK, I know that there's time slots available. If this said full, I would know that there are 10 belt packs connected to that antenna. Now. I'm not Dave, I'm not cool, I don't have two antennas, but I can tell you there's five lines here for a reason, all right? Because I can read up to five antennas at a time in walk test pro mode. Walk test mode, which this presentation is based off of, sorry, doing things backwards, test, walk test pro, you see one antenna at a time. And it gives you the RF strength again, negative 34, negative 30, just depends on how my hands are holding the belt pack. All right, so know how to get to Walk Test Pro because it's going to be handy for what we got going on here. Let's go back to screen share. Screen sharing, showing the screen, great. All right, so we can take this belt pack in Walk Test Pro mode. And we can start walking out from the antenna. We can get a baseline. What is our reading at the antenna? I, I've already told you. Cheating if you don't you know, scrub back in the video, but neg 24 is the best you will ever see. That is a belt pack up against an antenna, 
we know that we should go out NIG 25 before we start building a new array, right? Because that gives us that 20 dB of isolation. So we're sitting here in Walk Test Pro and we start taking readings as we go away from the antenna. He's saying 12 because he always starts at 30, but I'm gonna tell you 22 is fine, 25 is gonna be better, right? So neg 52, we're out there at a good number. We can start planting more antennas. We can start reusing time slots. That is how we start reusing time slots. I'm gonna back up here. Um, this is how we start reusing time slots, guys. Right here, okay. We use that belt pack. We use the tools that come with the product. We look at Walk Test Pro and we get away from our existing units. I would say, Dig 20, uh, you know, from 24, I would still go a little bit further than Dave here, but um, it'll work at this distance. Dave is always right on with his numbers. I like to add a little bit because, well, I know it'll still work, right? Um, so if, if we went out to NAG 54, I think is where I normally tell people to go, uh, you can start adding in another five antennas and reusing those time slots. So observations, based on the US system, it is important to note that within the near field RF coverage area, no matter if that area contains more than five antennas, there obviously cannot be more than 50 belt packs present in that one singular area, right? There's no way we can go more than 50 in a US space, but the space is small. Um, I've done it in a classroom where I think that, we had students about 25 feet away from the first antenna before we could start reusing time slots. Everybody's gonna say, well, what is that exact distance? Well, use the tools I've just showed you to, to figure out what that distance is because every RF area is unique. Every RF area has its own unique challenges. You do not know what else is broadcasting in that area. So I cannot give you a finite amount of numbers in feet and inches as to how far out you have to spread these antennas. This is on you examining your RF area with nothing more than an antenna and a Bolero belt pack. Now question, okay. is that those two different areas that are separated, can they be part of the same system on the same AS67 network, just separated? I'm glad you asked. Yes. Uh, you remember can go up to 100 antennas inside of a system. We didn't cap you at five antennas. You can go up to 100 antennas inside of a system. You can go up to 250 belt packs inside of a system. So obviously, if we didn't cap you at five antennas, you can go out to 100 antennas. I've got one customer that thought they wanted 100 antennas. They're only at 52 to cover the majority of their, their area. And I th they're upwards of 120 belt packs at this point in time that they can have on the system at any given time. Is there a way to put an antenna in a low power mode so it doesn't cover as far so I can reuse the frequency sooner? Yes, good question. Hold on real quick, let me end this slideshow because I always like to show that when we got it. <clears throat> so, if we go into the profile, whoops, antennas, function key, edit network space, uh, RF signal strength level. We have three settings normal, maximum outputs, like 100 milliwatts or something. Um, and I, and I say these because they, they vary. The antenna is not going to blast out at full power 100% of the time for a belt pack that is within a foot of it, all right? The antenna varies its power. What we're doing here is capping the, the maximum output, low and then ultra low, all right? And then again, just play with these in your RF space. Um, Ultra low is 
is pretty low and I, I had in our offices in Burbank, if anybody's been there, I was running low power and I had four unique islands throughout the building running about 200 belt packs, one in the training room, one in the mid office, one in the service department and one in shipping and receiving and easily was running four systems within sight of one another. Um, so I did not have to use ultra low to achieve. You were running them in what, what level? Low. Low. Okay. I know that yeah. in normal level, I've had the experience that one antenna covers an entire stadium without it, without any problem. So obviously if you're sticking it in a under, in a building, in a room somewhere, no reason to not use ultra low. Um, I will say this. Uh, I've I've been been asked multiple times by uh, engineering personnel that you know ultra low is pretty low. Let's put it that way. It's it in it, and it every we can we can agree that every transmitter uh, in the world does not transmit or behave uh, the same in the RF right. space when you start attenuating it that much, right? So I would stick to low and normal power and you're going to find that it's going to work just fine because right. ultra low power, I mean, you don't really need to stick a hundred people in a room that's 10 by 10, right? Right. And you're right. going to find that low is just going to be perfect for that situation. Now, positioning the antennas, let's say I'm in a, a, a hockey arena. Is it better to put the antennas on stands six, eight feet above the floor around the room or just put them up in the grid? It depends on a lot of things. Uh, ergo, again, depends on your RF environment, depends on where your belt packs are. Um, remember, you know, this, this stuff is the same RF that we've been dealing with for years. It's still radio frequency, right? So yeah. if you took your whip antenna, you had to know that that whip antenna permeated like a donut, okay? out yep. from that antenna. Now, if you put it up in the grid, your donut is partially lost, right? Because you've got part of it going up and then reflecting back down. You've got other uh, metal things around and it is nowhere near the receivers. So, right? so that antenna is not omni in all directions? It is, except for out the back. And that's okay, why out I was the bottom, the, right. The, the, uh, but it's an omni antenna, right? An omni antenna is, a, is is straight up and down whip that goes out like a donut. Okay, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So theoretically, there is a bit of an RF shadow beneath it. Right, right. Okay. So um, think about how you position and orientate your antennas from that perspective, right? When Dave shows his graphs here of these things, they permeate like donuts, you know, like a circle around. And yeah, this is, you know, you know, know that there's two omnidirectional antennas. But those inside antennas of this are, unit. are at 90 degrees in the box, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, this is almost a bad example for me to pull up right now, but yeah, yeah. it's, it's permeating from around that device. Um, obviously RF doesn't pass very well through the back of the antenna because well, it's metal. Um, makes it a little hard, right? Right. Uh, to pass through there. Hey, Jeff, you hear me? Oh my gosh! It's a voice. Yeah, I past, apologize, guys. folks. Uh, I experienced a substantial uh, internet service disruption in my geographic area, so I am on the phone. But uh, here to help Jeff if you need any questions answered, by all means. Great. Thank you for joining us, Dave. Um, we earlier denied your phone call. Uh, that was a vote amongst everybody else. <laughs> we, we, he held the phone up and said, should we answer the phone or not? <laughs> yeah, luckily, uh, you only have my audio, so you don't have to witness my camera. There we go. Uh, person asked, uh, Alan, Adrian Sterling asked, is Walk Test Pro new? And what's the no. difference? Walk test pro has always been there. We never yeah, had it, amateur. Well, yeah. Uh, walk test pro allows you to see five antennas at a time. Um, walk test 
is easier-ish to read, right? And there's bigger, there's bigger readouts, really, if you can see yeah. my yeah. camera at all, yeah. you know? Yeah, so it, it really, it's meant to be useful for referencing one antenna. So for this purpose of, you know, doing a quick site survey of where to place your next antenna, it's really the right tool. WalkTest Pro is a really great, let's call it a 10,000 foot view tool, um, where you can see all of your surrounding antennas, at least in the immediate surroundings, um, so that you know how to load balance your system. Uh, you know, because you want to really look at the perspective of what that belt pack sees to all of its surroundings. And you want to try to balance your distribution of antennas so really that that belt pack sees the right spread. In other words, you don't want a belt pack to experience uh, high RF strength uh, to three different antennas. You really want it to see high RF strength to one or two, and then the others taper off by 15, 20 dB a piece. So this goes back to a question from John Arenas. If you put three antennas right next to each other or really close together, are you going to, do you have to do something special to prevent overloading the antennas or do they overload well, at all? Really the recommendation is uh, three foot separation um, and obviously don't point the antennas directly at each other. Now, although they're omnidirectional, as Jeff alluded to earlier, um, the rear lobe of that EMAG plot for the antenna's radiation is, is pretty low. So, so basically stack them with the bottoms facing the top. Yeah, you can put them back to back to back, uh, almost like a cell tower. Oh, okay. Uh, just don't point them directly at each other. That's just the re receiver desense that most RF equipment experiences. Is there any, have you ever, uh, anybody ever used like a pizza pan or anything like that to sort of direct? No, that's a, image? that's been a popular tool. Um, I've seen, I've seen some older RTS systems use that theory. I've seen a couple uh, a couple old ClearCom systems use that theory about trying to redirect uh, energy. Um, but again, that's using a very archaic codec. Um, the RF filtering in this codec is is so advanced that you, you don't need those tools. You don't need to play those games. Right. Yeah. Are there polar plots available? Uh, for the antennas themselves, I can dig some up. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. I think, that, I mean, I've always assumed that it's low out the bottom and it's pretty much equal every other direction. Yeah, it's almost um, uh, just not far off with the donut. Um, although it's vertical linear polarized, not circular polarized, it, it does kind of emit off of the antenna body like a donut or more like a croissant, again, because the rear lobe is, is lower than the front. Cardioid. Uh, Ike Zimbel asked an obvious question. Uh, if you're in an area that has other decked systems operating, how, uh, how does the system react and how do you deal with that? Like maybe uh, uh, free speak or Romeo in the same space. Yeah, that's actually covered in some upcoming slides, but the short answer is that um, they can coexist. And because our belt packs are registered uniquely to our system and their belt packs are registered uniquely to their own system um, and our system encrypts the, uh, the audio transmission, there's really no danger of audibly interfering and breaking into another system. Um, because they're both deck based, they're both based off the same theory. And although they use different codecs, um, the, the commonality of both being deck means that inadvertently you could have a belt pack from our system um, occupy the time slot space um, on they, their system. Would but they just it's, fight it's, for the time slots and increase the latency? No, it, it basically, um, it generically might sit on a time slot on their system, but it actually won't do anything because it speaks right. a different language. So it might occupy the RF space of a time slot. But even if it does, it's only going to do it for a quick moment because part of the nature of DECT is a constant assignment and reassignment of time slot carrier um, for any belt pack device. 
and it does deck does that on a consistent and constant basis to optimize its its performance level um, so really that's the, that's the worst case but honestly an antenna is going to direct a belt pack on where to go and when to go there so 99 out of 100 times that belt pack is never going to be attracted by a disparate system it's always going to follow the lead of the antenna in its own system so that's pretty much the questions we have right now if you want to go on Dave I got the slides up uh, I'm on slide 20 if you want to talk over it I'll advance Sure, let me see. Uh, I'm actually looking at you guys on my cell phone, so I'll do the best I can. It's a little small, but um, yeah, if you want to give me a couple of clicks, and I think what we're looking at here. We're on the observations is, all the way through. I just loaded the whole page. Yeah, no worries. There's actually a couple more points here if you want to advance. There we go. And one more. That's the next screen. Okay, keep going. Okay, there we go. So really the, the point of this is to show beyond the initial placement of an antenna and where the, the optimal position is to place your next antenna to achieve that separation from the one nearest to it. Um, we combine that idea with load balancing your system. You know, again, it goes back to the theory of you don't want uh, a belt pack to necessarily um, see three surrounding antennas of equal signal strength. You want to make best use of those antennas, so you want to spread them out so that the antenna, uh, so that the belt pack is naturally attracted to progressing through the antenna chain so so that it leaves one area of one antenna and it's naturally attracted to the next antenna because the one it's walking towards appears stronger to it than the last antenna did so it's all about load balancing and again um, this is that idea of, of really strategically placing your antennas based on signal strength so that you're balancing signal strength as the bell pack walks you know, in a, in a linear fashion from away from one antenna towards the next and then away from that one and towards the next one, et cetera. Uh, and again, that's where Walk Test Pro comes in really handy. Once you have laid out your antenna array, you can go to Walk Test Pro and really it will show you, as Jeff said, the top five antennas that are, are nearest in strength to that belt pack where that belt pack is standing at that moment. So a bird's eye view as that belt pack sees the antenna array in total. And that way you can assure that, you know, oh, wow, look, antenna one is at 38 dBm. Antenna two is not at 39. You don't want it at 39. You want it to be somewhere in the 50s. And then you want the next one to be somewhere in the 70s. So a good tool to use, uh, Walk Test Pro, to achieve what we're looking at here. So we're on the let's review slide. Okay, yeah, um, keep clicking through and I'll, I'll just talk over you. Um, so this is really what we're talking about is a synchronous system. Um, we're talking about antennas that belong to the same physical Bolero hardware grouping, let's call it. Um, all of the antennas are connected to a common switch. Um, to a common artist frame or group of artist frames, but the point is, is all of the antennas are associated together in the Bolero user interface software. So they are all virtually grouped together in one contiguous group. And there is one uh, PTP master, one deck master. There's an antenna, a single antenna in that array that is distributing sync to all of the other antennas so that they're all synchronous. And uh, as we advance the slides, I'll show you what that means. Okay, so here we're looking at the idea 
that from the yellow antenna's point of view, it sees the red antenna and the green antenna. Uh, and it sees, again, what we looked at uh, in the beginning, it, it scans the area and sees what time slots those antennas are using for belt packs that are being hosted by each one of those antennas respectively. The key here is that all three antennas are phase aligned. They're, they're sourcing back to the same PTP source one of the antennas in that group so that all of your pulses these little you know yellow red and green pulses they represent the time slots um, the digital pulses uh, that the belt packs are actually occupying and if they're in phase then they're all recognizable and as we advance through the slides you'll see what happens when they're out of phase Okay, so now we're seeing a slide showing that we have uh, really three disparate systems. Uh, so maybe, you know, in, in an example that we're all probably familiar with, uh, Stadium Control Jumbotron is using one Bolero system. Um, Network is using another one to do uh, pregame, postgame, stand-up interviews on the 30. And, uh, you know, maybe... There's a third system, maybe uh, NFL Game Day Operations is using a third system, right? So you have three systems that are all disparate, um, and they're all referencing to their own unique uh, sync source. So what you end up with is this picture where the pulses are misaligned. So when one system using its own sync looks at another system using uh, a disparate sync, it's not going to see the time slots in time. It's going to see them offset because they're, they're asynchronous to one another. So what the result is, is it's looking at the other system and indeed the other system is showing an empty time slot, but because it's out of sync or out of phase, it sees half a time slot. It sees half of a, a positive rising slope of that time slot and half of the next. So what it looks like to the software in the Bolero system, it looks like that time slot's occupied when it's actually not. So what it does, it says, well, I guess I can't use that one, and I guess I can't use the one next to it. When it, in actuality, you probably could have if they were all phase aligned. Um, so again, this problem is only going to be an issue if all of the systems, all of these disparate systems, the network, uh, you know, Stadium, Jumbotron, and, uh, you know, the League Game Day Ops, if all of those systems have their antennas literally 10 feet away from one another, and they're all using uh, collectively 50 bell packs in a space, uh, you know, as big as, you know, a, a 15 foot by 15 foot area, let's say, for a simple example, that's never going to happen. Really, all we want to do here is explain the fact that if for some crazy reason you had a gig one day where three systems were in the same uh, backstage area at, um, at an award show and you had collectively 50 bell packs, the best solution is to distribute a common PTP sync to all three systems because all 50 bell packs and all the antennas from all three systems are in the same, you know, 25 foot radius. That would be a total of 50 among all the systems. Yeah, exactly. And right. that would be the perfect storm. And that's almost never going to happen. But if it did, that's the solution. I've got a question, um, which uh, we all talked about before the show. And if you could explain it again, Will, will we be talking about a method using separate networks to lock people out of certain areas? Well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways. Um, I think the, the first most obvious way is that, well, let's clarify the example. Are we talking about having one composite Bolero system and then certain belt packs that are members of that system can only have access to certain areas and certain antennas? Correct. Correct. 
they may have the same party line, but but let's yeah. say the example of limiting stage managers and A2s to the dressing room area, and nobody else can get on those antennas. Exactly. You don't want to overload um, a mission critical antenna that a stage manager is operating on just right. because five utilities are, you know, taking a smoke break nearby. Yep. Right. Um, you know, there, there's ways to mitigate that. Um, I think the best way is, as we talked about um, first, is to create um, antenna subsystems and let the belt packs or don't let the belt packs uh, roam to adjacent systems. And you be on separate uh, uh, antenna networks, set up a separate antenna network. Yeah, you would. Hardware, you, but. you would probably, uh, in the simplest form, is you would segregate or VLAN off the antennas, um, and you would create separate, multiple, unique uh, antenna domains, virtual domains in the in the Bolero software. So you're so basically you would you would sync the bell pack with each of the domains and give the bell pack the permission to go between them automatically. Exactly. And you could give or not give uh, permission to roam automatically and connect automatically system to system. Or you could also, um, you know, restrict them to manually and deliberately logging onto the next system. And in order to do that, they would, of course, need uh, a password. Yeah. But could they could they just walk into the other area and near field think to a, another bell pack or an antenna in the other area? Well, two things are going to happen. You know, there is there is the chance that that bell pack, um, you know, may occupy its time slot on that antenna inadvertently. But again, it's only going to be for a brief moment in time before the antenna management looks at that bell pack and says, well, you know, two things. As part of DECT, I'm going to constantly assign and reassign uh, time slots. And in that instance, that rogue bell pack is going to be gone anyway. Uh, secondly, obviously, the antenna is going to realize that that bell pack is not registered to its logical group. Um, and it's not going to allow it access. Right. That's part of if you near fielded it, you would not have an assigned Bolero Bell Pack ID. Because remember, you do have to go into the web GUI to assign an ID. Yeah. And that's what, you know, beyond the registration process, that's what makes a Bell Pack uh, a unique exclusive member of that antenna group, right? Is the fact that you've assigned an ID to it and given it a personality that's tracked back to the artist rank. And also you have, as an antenna group, um, taken a digital picture of that bell pack and memorized its its hardware ID and assigned a um, an assignment number to it in the first place. So if it doesn't recognize the hardware, the antenna group won't do anything with it which is kind of the safety mode. On top of the fact that, again, the, the um, audio transport is, is encrypted um, so that it, never mind, it won't connect to it audibly, but it won't unencrypt the audio even if it somehow could. And we, we I think we talked about this question when you were uh, sequestered and not here. If, if we're, Back to the question of another person asked if the perfect storm includes products like Free Speak or Romeo in the same area, mm -hmm. uh, how and, and you want to use 50 bell packs, how affected will Bolero be with the other system being there? Or do you have to also count the other devices in your 50 count? You have to cumulatively count all of the radiating devices. So in this case, you have to account for all of the bell packs. And you also have to account for the fact that there are some systems out there that use more than one time slot. Right. Um, but Even from... One is one. Yeah, exactly, yeah. But so from a Bolero point of view, um, 
you know, obviously there is the uh, advantage that we know our performance will be better because we only use one time slot with the understanding that if we start to reach or approach any limits that, you know, the free speak standalone is going to be um, the one that's going to hurt more because right. they have to use two time slots. So, you know, of course, if we're both co-located in that near field environment in that perfect storm, um, you know, we have to consider the fact that free speak is going to take up two. Does it affect us? Not really. Does it affect right. them a lot more? And again, you know, um, don't be afraid of the idea or don't, you know, have your mind try to logically deny the idea of distributing a common PTP to um, never mind disparate Bolero systems, but um, disparate DEC systems of, you know, different manufacturers. It, it doesn't really matter. They're, they both operate on the premise of DEC um, and they can both lock to a common time base. Um, so, I've actually but, done it. But, but the, the, the sync outputs, inputs on a uh, free speak system aren't necessarily PTP sync or compatible with plugging into Riedel. Right. You'd have to have some kind of conversion device or protocol. Right. And, and really the key there is, you know, any, any decent um, third party um, PTP capable, you know, time-based generator um, is going to have uh, multiple form Man outputs. Um, you know, like an Everts 5602 is, is going to have uh, PTP outputs. It's going to have um, word clock outputs. It's going to have, um, you know, baseband, uh, bi-level and tri-level uh, video sync. So you can, you can find that so that um, the heartbeat is common to all those formats. It's just that they're transcoded into different formats but locked to the same heartbeat from that master generator. Okay. Uh, a quick question, licensing for Bolero standalone versus integrated, or is there licensing? Um, yeah, I mean, there's licensing for the standalone, um, and just in case it wasn't covered during the standalone presentation, currently the licensing is node locked. So it is attributed to a specific antenna, um, you know, upon release from manufacturing, and it will that license will live with that antenna. In the future, it will be commutable. Um, so that you can move that license from piece of hardware to piece of hardware, which is obviously very handy, um, you know, if you're a rental house and you're configuring, reconfiguring and building systems all the time. Um, in the Blero integrated, um, there's really no license per se. Um, you're not prohibited from using the system, um, you know, outside of purchasing the hardware and loading the firmware and opening up the software interface and off and running. Does having a one of your antennas uh, licensed as a standalone give you any advantage in using it as integrated? Um, there is a caveat. So you can mix in integrated mode because, um, you know, a certain level of negotiation and uh, audio mixing and, and, you know, data recognition in the system, because a certain level of that in the integrated system is handled by the artist matrix and not by the antennas, um, you can mix what's called generation one and generation two antenna hardware in integrated mode. Once you move to running in a standalone system, um, the G1 antenna hardware is not sophisticated enough to understand the standalone license or the internal mixing mechanisms that occur in a standalone system. So you can only use G2 antenna hardware if you're applying a standalone license. 
but you can mix so, G1 so and we, G2 so in an integrated system. In standalone, it has to all be G2. Yep. Whereas in integrated, you can get away with some of them being G1. Yep, exactly. Or or all of them. Yeah, exactly. Um, and again, that's because of you know, the level of sophistication um, that's required in in the or to be supported by the hardware. And is that a hardware difference? Yeah. Not firmware. Yeah, it's it's basically uh, I would state it that way that um, you know the the firmware that's running the software that's being implemented um, can only be supported by a certain version of hardware when you get to the standalone mechanism. Okay, I think we have, have uh, um, basically asked a lot of the questions. Um, anything more in the presentation you wanna talk about or talk about this terrific, fantastic installation? Um, yeah, you know, this was uh, a, this was a presentation I did uh, a couple of years ago. So some of these gigs are pretty old, but it gives you the idea. Um, and Jeff, I think you're familiar with this, right? Because this was uh, LA Convention Center. This is Anaheim Convention Center. I'm familiar with the product or project. Or, uh, yeah, it was BlizzCon. Yeah, BlizzCon, several stages. Uh, entire comm system spread out through the entire venue, several little islands. Uh, I think they actually improved on it even more last year than they did this the year that you did this presentation. Yeah, and I think on the on the previous slide or the one following this, it, it shows the metrics of you know how many systems, how many belt packs. Um, yeah, uh, Radio City Music Hall, you know very well. Yep, and and really uh, what all of these show, but specifically the BlizzCon because it was such a big system. Um, you know, you can have uh, unique Bolero systems coexist in fairly tight spaces, although, you know, the Anaheim Convention Center is hardly a tight space. But uh, point being is you can have them coexist and you can have belt packs from one system walking through another system's area, um, you know, and because of the unique registration process that makes belt packs belong to one system or another, even though they're walking through there, they're not really interfering with it. Um, you know, so this is kind of the practical example that proves that, that you can have literally, um, you know, 100, 150 belt packs in that convention center that belong to different systems and they can all coexist. I think last year was 100 belt packs, one can join system. You can pretty much walk anywhere in there. Yeah. Yeah, so in this system, they had, uh, I think, five unique systems. And one of those was they had antennas. Yeah, the, the yellow system had antennas dropped across the entire venue, including inside the zones of other systems. Um, so, again, it's all because of Bolero's, you know, registration system, unique registration system, the security, the encryption. Um, you know, the fact that every antenna knows what belt pack belongs to it and what doesn't belong to it. Um, it's it's a very sophisticated um, software management system as well as RF system. So this system was using standalone artist systems in each place? Y yeah, these were um, artist integrated systems and they were unique systems unto themselves. So it was, you know, different production companies uh, represented per color. You want to talk about Radio City Music Hall? Yeah, again, you know, just uh, looking at the idea that Radio City Music Hall is um, a fairly tight space, um, and we were able to achieve enough separation in that fairly tight space um, to get, you know, upwards of 70 to 100 belt packs at reusing these time slots. And, you know, we were able to load balance. Uh, this particular example is really focusing on the idea of load balancing a stage. And that stage is fairly small, but yet you're able to point the antennas in such a way to play with the signal strength so that, you know, when you have 
um, you know, 40 utilities coming off stage left to change uh, a set scene, and then they're running off stage right, um, they're still not locked to the antennas on stage left and nobody can use them. You know what I mean? So it's all about load balancing. It's all about getting your belt packs to be attracted to the right antenna based on where you are geographically. You don't want a belt pack to lock on one antenna uh, for the rest of its life. You want it to move around. You, and you what know? do you do to adjust that? Um, a lot of times, you know, because right now the uh, the power level adjustability is um, antenna array wide and not able to be adjusted per singular antenna yet. Um, you play with that by changing the azimuth and the elevation of the antenna. So let's say don't point the antenna directly at the stage, you know, maybe uh, offset it by 30 degrees. Um, you know, play with the gain of the antenna um, by, by physically changing its orientation and where it's located and, and, you know, and then take your belt packs and do a walk test, you know, walk to uh, the 50 yard line on the stage between stage left and stage right until you see that belt pack switch over at center stage from the antennas on one wing to the antennas in the opposite wing and play with that, that geographically. Is that strictly a level fencing in the belt pack or is there something else going on? Um, there, there's a lot of things, you know, there's the idea of just bare bones, generic signal strength, but there's also the idea uh, that there's a very complex algorithm running in the background that's looking at distortion levels constantly. Um, every antenna is pinging every belt pack that it's servicing um, to understand its level of, of volatility, right? And the system is talking to every antenna in the system and antennas are communicating. So, you know, the antenna on stage right is communicating to the software mechanism and the antenna on stage left that's currently hosting that bell pack is as well. And at some point, they're both going to discuss the topic and say, you know what, I can't, I can't really host this bell pack any longer because it, it's just the distortion levels are too high and you look like you have better levels because you're pinging that bell pack as well. So let's switch them over to you. And that's done in the bell pack? That's happening in the antenna system in the software mechanism that's managing the antenna system, but the antennas themselves are pinging the belt packs and taking these distortion readings constantly. And might you uh, maybe to, to load balance set some of the antennas to low power? Um, yeah, you, you absolutely could. And, you know, again, the limitation right now is that you have to do it uh, to the entire logical antenna array so you know if you've grouped all the antennas in stage left stage right proper into a bucket and called that a logical rf domain you'd have to adjust the power level of all of the antennas collectively as a group not just one um but then overall then will never get used what's that that low power antenna will hardly ever get used if it's in an area well, with much a high high standard power. Well, again, you're gonna you're really going to change the power level of the entire antenna group, not just one individual antenna. Now, if you have multiple antenna groups um, that need to be logged logged into and logged out of, then yeah, oh, okay. you could, and and you had those located uh, next to each other, then yeah. But the idea really is that you you mitigate your antenna group by area you know like you said in the earlier example right, right. you might have an antenna group that's backstage in the dressing room area you right. might have another one that's in um stage left etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's it's really all about um you know if you're going to change power level you got to do it with the whole antenna group and Why really you're you're going to do it because do that what's that what happens if you only could change half of them? Well, you can't. You can only change the entire group, uh, the entire logical group. Oh, it's not an antenna setting. It's a, it's a, it's a uh, antenna network. It's a, yeah, it's okay. So when you go to the the Blero software and you group antennas into a common bucket and you call that a logical RF domain, 
that's because you've collected them together and and built them into a logical group in the software so that the software that's management easy. knows to consider okay. those as a cohesive group that's going to negotiate amongst each other. Um, but in general, I could say that in um, in that venue, because it was so tight and we had so many antennas and there was a lot of uh, chance for multipath, that we ran that system on medium power and not high power to minimize the splatter. Because um, you know, in tight spaces, if you're running at full power and there's a lot of contributing factors, you know, let's face it, um, RF energy is going to be sure, manipulated sure. by any conductive element, anything made out of metal, et cetera, et cetera. So that we did have a question from John Arenas. If you have uh, several antennas in one area, is there a chance of overloading? And the answer is yes. Um, Due to overloading like in that. the like, sense, yeah, you're overloading in the sense of you're you're creating a lot of RF splatter. Uh, you're creating um, lowest power. Yeah, you're encouraging multipath because you know your antenna is radiating to uh, a metallic object, a set piece that's 10 feet away from it. And if you run it at full power, it's going to create a lot. It's like a garden hose. You know, if you stand 10 feet away from a wall and you run a garden hose at full speed, you're going to get wet. If you close that valve down half the way, you probably won't get wet. So it's good to do, do your walk test. And if you have really, really strong signal everywhere, maybe try it at low. Yeah. And, and in the menu, uh, you're going to see uh, frame error rate um, accumulate in the menu of the belt pack. And, you know, if, if that number starts to escalate very quickly, you know, frame error rates are a result of interference, but they're also a result of, of excessive multipaths. So in that instance, you know, the first thing to try is, is you know, ramp your power down on all your antennas. And I bet that number goes down significantly. Well, I think we have uh, uh, exhausted our audience of uh, uh, questions because they haven't asked a question in 30 minutes. Is there another part of this presentation you want to finish up or? Um, not really. I think that uh, we just um, we're running through the last couple of examples. I mean, Jeff, if you want, feel free to click through them. It's just, you know, more. Um, yeah, I think this was. This is the no name. Yeah, this this may be arenas. So that could be could be football, could be soccer. This. Yeah. Um, this is just showing, you know, it looks a lot like XFL in Giants Stadium. A couple yeah. of years ago, uh, Riedel hired me to go to a, a, an arena a stadium in uh, Philadelphia to demo the uh, Bolero system. And we put one antenna up in the press booth behind the glass and used four antennas, four belt packs for the cameras during the entire show. And it worked fine, the whole stadium. Oh, yeah. And, you know, again, that goes back to, to paying tribute to the uh, design of the codec being yep. used and also the RF filtering um, hardware that's being used. And, and just, you know, it's a great, great system. It throws away the junk and it keeps the rest. And it's almost like if you need to wear glasses and you don't wear your glasses, and you're trying to see something that's 100 yards away, you can kind of right. see it, but not really. You put your glasses on, you can see it perfectly. That's why you can put one antenna in a stadium and, and you know, and go at it. You know, and that falls under the category of just because you can doesn't mean you should. Obviously, you want to try and have redundancy, multiple antennas, play to the design of debt, which is diversity. In your Anaheim Convention Center uh, diagram, did you distribute sync to all those systems or with some of them running wild? No, and that's, um, that's the magical thing about that example is it really was a worst case scenario because it was, um, you know, disparate systems that had nothing to do with one another running their own sync. And yeah, and uh, it, it ran great. And, and that's because... Um, 
that was an example of that far field environment, you know, where you weren't, the place is so big and you had enough separation that um, you were never in that situation where you were, you know, directly in the midst of the other person's near field. Um, what is an acceptable offset PTP on an antenna? And how can I how can you read it in the Bolero GUI? So um, we look at two things. We we look at something like um, the maximum allowable path delay for the media transport, and that's literally that. You start at zero and you walk a mile, and there's a certain amount of maximum delay that's that accumulates. PTP offset is more of a variance. Um, Again, I, I think of when you're timing a CCU in the old days to a switcher input, you know, you got your screwdriver out and you're swinging uh, your signal left and right so that it falls in an allowable window of time at the switcher input. And if it's not in that window, then you don't get in. It's the same thing. It's, it's almost a plus minus variance. So the PTP offset basically is a result of switches and more switches in the same network and they all contribute a certain amount of um, delay between one another so it's a plus minus offset and that maximum is one microsecond um, you can see it in the um, in the AS67 statistics window in the director software but from the point of view of an antenna, um, you can see it in the real-time log files that the antennas are generating. Click info now. Uh, Dave, what's that? I'm on the screen. So if you go to antennas, you find your net. Yeah. You click next to, you click this info tab. Yes, yes, it's on there. It's on there as well. Yeah, it's on there your, as well. Your reading will be here. Unfortunately, um, this is the master. So. There is no offset information. Why? Because right, it's because you're, faster. It's beating you're the at, drum. Yeah, you're at ground zero, right? Yeah, it will it will be in that window if you have a live system, right? And that's kind of the the real time log files is what produces that. And um, what do you want to watch for? Uh, you want to watch for it to exceed one microsecond, because um, when it does, you start to, you know, not be able to put packets together in the right order. Remember that the wireless part of this relationship between the antenna and the belt pack is based on that kind of taking these really quick snapshots of audio, putting them in a bucket, pushing them down a pipe, and then putting them back together at the other end. And you need precise timing marks on all of those packets to be able to put them back together in the right order. And if your network timing starts to exceed the allowable values because you have too many switches or there's you know too much of a load on the system, then you're not gonna be able to put those audio packets, those RF packets back together in the right order because remember that that frequency time division multiple access thing that's happening in the RF domain, that's that sync is referencing the network PTP sync. So it's sampling the network sync. And if the network sync's not right, then your wireless FTDMA sync isn't gonna be right. And if that's not right, the audio packets are gonna fail out and you're gonna get frame error rates. So it's, it's caused by a network problem and you have to deal with your network. That's how you fix it. Yeah, it, it all sources back to the network and the network health and building the network in the right way and and you know um, recognizing and respecting um, QoS policies you know PTP no, has a any, you're not going to get any error anywhere if it's not working that way you have to notice it um, you're going to notice it audibly you know you start to get, get you, hits in your audio um, and that's what's going to make you go look oh, okay um, but yeah, you know, you have to, it starts with the network and you have to 
like I said, respect the QoS policy for the PTP traffic on the network, respect the QoS policy for the media traffic on the network. They're prioritized for a reason. They go into certain transmit queues. Um, you know, it's I, I kind of liken it to if you're on, um, you know, Sixth Avenue in Manhattan at 5 p.m. on a normal day um, and all the traffic lights go out then packets or cars are just bumping into each other. Nobody's going anywhere. If you have a traffic cop at every corner and traffic lights at every corner, then there's a synchronized process of sending traffic this way and then stopping it and then sending traffic across the cross streets, et cetera, et cetera, in an organized fashion. QoS policy does that. And right. having, um, having switches that understand PTP does that. Um, you know, having switches that understand PTP, it's almost like uh, having frame syncs um, in, a, in a video network, right? You're reclocking everything. Switches are helping to reclock signals to minimize uh, PTP offset, to, to make sure that the timing is that much tighter and that much more precise by the time it gets to the antennas and the antennas sample that network timing and turn it into decked RF timing. It all goes together. Yeah. I know personally I've had many tickets for bad PTP from police. So <laughs> uh, I think we've pretty much reached the uh, the end of the road. It's been a terrific uh, show and had a great response from all of the attendees. Great, great. Yeah, and, and again, um, I apologize for the weather in my area. Um, we've just had uh, multiple service failures in, in my geographic area. So, Jeff, uh, you're a soldier, man. Um, thanks for picking up when I when I uh, dropped off. I really appreciate it. Uh, no problem. We knew it was going to happen. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You know, the uh, you always have a plan, right? And David, thank you for powering through, man. We were we were texting while you were trying to work through blown up routers, powers, carrier down, you name it. And thanks for coming through, dialing in. That's the beauty of this platform, you know. And uh, I think, you know, what we experienced today is exactly what we're experiencing in the market. They're they're yep. just keep looking for opportunities, man. Look for ways to stay connected, right? Don't give up. Um, and I really appreciate your time, uh, uh, David. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for the, there was so much info here. I was just uh, <laughs> thinking through, you know, it's just, that's why we have it on video on demand, right? So tomorrow sometime you can go in, watch through this again. Um, you know, you've got our contact info, folks. If there's some questions that didn't get answered, we'll be happy to um, connect you up uh, with, uh, with some folks where you can get that answer. You know, obviously once we get in the field, those things happen. Good point about registering for the software. Um, you know, these are those times when when there's no excuse when you get in the field next time that you don't have everything that you need because you've had a couple of weeks to uh, to make all those contacts. So uh, I am just going to talk real quick tomorrow. Lunch with Pete best uh you know our best audio rf scans around the world so pete's buying lunch again tomorrow uh which means you'll probably go hungry but that's okay but you won't be hungry for info because there'll be plenty of that i'm sure we'll have a few people joining us uh you know to also we talked about picking up some questions on is things like that and then the afternoon i just read this label here wireless happy hour with jetwave wireless right um that's the first happy hour we're hosting during our four o'clock. You know, it's five o'clock somewhere. So um, by the time we get over, it'll be five o'clock. And uh, they're going to be talking about WYSICOM specifically um, and their implementation of WYSICOM products, right? So RF over fiber, uh, distributed antenna system. So that's a hot new uh, topic that, um, and, you know, WYSI has, of course, become uh, synonymous with some really creative uh, solutions. So, um, any closing thoughts, guys, before you uh, go to dinner? Yeah, Kelly, I would just say that um, you know uh, we we really jumped into the middle of the topic today because we really wanted to focus on uh, you know the idea of scaling up a Bolero system. But obviously, um, you know there is a lot of background information around the basics of building the system. Um, 
that if people are interested in, um, you know, the assumption being that they kind of knew that part to begin with. And if any of you didn't, by all means, please uh, reach out to myself or, or Kelly and we'll get you the background information necessary to put two and two together. Yeah, you bet. And you know what? I bet if we're really nice to David and we get a lot of interest about a topic, um, uh, when he has connectivity restored to his house again, maybe we can uh, convince him to come on. But, uh, you know, uh, and send out your questions, comments. We'll, uh, we'll be happy to field all of those. Um, thanks again uh, to uh, you guys. And Mac, Pete, uh, any uh, thoughts? Well, we did have a couple of comments wanting to know if that vocal master works. It does work. There we go. Well, we, we want to see you do a show with it at some point. I'm going to go pull the I'm going to go pull the um, the speakers out of storage this weekend and I'll have those on the air next week. So there we um, go. Perfect. I better Perfect. prove that it works. <laughs> so uh, anyhow. I guess that'll do it. Uh, I'm going to go grab some dinner now, and uh, hopefully everybody can do the same, and I look forward to everybody joining us uh, tomorrow for the next wave. So thanks again. So long, David. So long, Jeff. Have a good we'll night, We'll see guys. you tomorrow. Bye -bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.